All right, here it is. A Wednesday, I'm sorry, a Monday night on Twitch. It's 6.30 Central Standard Time, and that means it is time for us to take a little bit of a journey <clears throat> as we begin exploring the game worlds that we're building specifically for a brand new campaign. And I'm just working on a couple of updates here. Let me get these on the system and then we will dive right in where we last left off. And I hope everybody's weekend was fantastic and enjoyable. I hope you are feeling very creative and looking at your own campaign worlds and building campaigns, prepping up for games. I am excited actually for this campaign. This is the one that we are doing from 1 to 20. Of course, all the tools that you're seeing have been uploaded onto my Patreon, if you so choose. You can download them there if you are interested. All righty. Let's dive right in. Now you can see on the big screen here we have the 99% inked map and then a map below that is not only inked but also beginnings of color pencil for the city that we are going to be exploring of Goldgate. Now the initial premise of this campaign is that our characters who will begin the adventure at level one are en route to Golden Vale where they are hoping to join the Adventuring League and go to the Adventures Guild. However, storms are going to drive them indoors at Gold Gate. This allows a couple of things. If they're coming by sea, if they're coming from either direction, this is that central gathering point before they head to Green Vale. Now, that aspect we have not explored at all. We're focusing right around Golden Gate and last time we did in the city we talked a little bit about the exploration of the canals then the exploration of the sewers and then the exploration of the woods now we know the next adventure is going to be exploration in the woods and that is actually up to this point going to be the longest adventure that the characters will face and the reason I say that is all based on your adventuring day to level up averages. So if we get our sheets here, we know that it's going to be 2.2 days of adventuring. 2.2 days of adventuring in the hills. And so we know that that's going to be two full adventuring days. And then it's going to have a half or a or basically 1.5 medium encounters on that point two day. That will be the next point of level up. So we have that aspect all kind of thought about. We know what we have to do. Now we just have to kind of map it out. Now we know that when the characters are exploring the canals and the sewers and the woods, we know it's a trickle down effect, right? The goblins, who are generally in the hills have started invading the woods, driving the cultists into the sewers and some of the sewer creatures into the canal. So it's that trickle down effect. But to bring it back full circle, we know that the cultists in the sewers are going to have to have an impact later in the story. And these figures are going to be cultists of Hecate. So that's kind of the primary uh, linchpin, the thing that's pulling all the strings or the driving force behind the entire story. The entire story revolves around um, 
the followers of Hecate, Aja specifically, trying to get that Hecate scepter and ultimately create more larvae in the gray wastes and ruin some clout from Elysium. So that's the overarching, that's the backbone of the story. And we've just trickled it down into our lower level. So the cultists, we know that they're going to have symbols of the moon, uh, symbols of Hecate. I'm going to probably do a game aid with the map from the sewers leading them into the area of the woods. It's going to have that symbol of Hecate. Now, whether or not the characters are able to realize what that is and what the impact is, it's hard to say if they pass a high enough religion check possibly, but it's not a super well-known uh, pantheon in most games. So it's very probable that this is going to be something that's pretty secretive and they may not realize there's a bigger aspect to it. They may think that they've quelled the cultists of Hakate and that's it because as we move up away from this aspect into Greenvale, the theme shifts as does the nemesis of our campaign. So at that point, that's when we're going to introduce Drethel, um, who has two parts to his kind of story arc. So the first part, he wants to get the Mystic Cornucopia, which we actually, I updated that a little bit and called it the Bountiful Cornucopia because it's going to be an enchanted item. It's going to be a relic. It's going to be an aspect of the, oh my gosh, I'm losing my mic here. It's going to be an aspect of, of the game that uh, there is no item currently built for it so I'm gonna have to design it and everything when we get up into that level but that's where the meat and potatoes of this adventure is going to be is in these tiers here that's where the adventurers are going to spend the majority of their time you can see two days two days two days two days two days of adventuring days and not just regular days these days are not going to fall just one after another after another um, and we'll space them out so that they have a lot more meat on them and has some opportunity for the players to have downtime and work on some of the player aspects and player stories and player development, or I'm sorry, character aspects, character stories and character development in the interim as well, and should provide for a lot more RP. Now with this aspect, one of the things that we started to do was the treasure and I wanted to retouch that just a little bit because there is an aspect of the treasure that um, we started to dole out initially and there have been a couple of updates basically the first adventure I've got to uh, get all my stuff into manila envelopes still yet. The first adventure had them come across some of the magical items and that was with the cultists um, ultimately getting while they're exploring in the sewers they're going to get uh, from the crocodiles Horde, they are going to get uh, some scrolls and a potion of healing. So scrolls and potion of healing. Now it doesn't sound like much, but I do go by rules as uh, written for those aspects. So keeping accountability of those, uh, what the party is going to achieve or earn or win, however, whatever you want to call it is an important aspect for my games because of the balance aspect and so somewhere here I don't know where I put it I have a sheet to track boy I'm just a wreck today the magic items well I thought I did I thought I did let me look one spot real quick and just see if I put it down somewhere incorrectly. 
Let me check. Hmm. Well, I don't know where I put it. But basically, it is a tracker for the magic items that the party is going to get. So I'll have to explore it a little bit more on the next one. So in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and put down just on a scratch paper a uh, spell scroll of grease and calm emotions. And then they also had a potion of healing. And this was supposed to be three of them. So what I want to do is compare that randomly rolled treasure off the chart to my magic item uh, allotment keeper so that I can track and make sure that I don't give out too much too early or of the incorrect items and everything because I do want to have good balance to it. And this doesn't feel too extreme. It is a little bit more than I would generally give at first level with those three potions of healing. I would generally have... Uh, maybe one, um, possibly two at most. But again, I want to keep a, a balance. I don't want too much getting out there. But with that being said, we can then, as we start building our plans for adventuring into the hills, where there will be a goblin uh, settlement, I'll be able to manage the rewards for the players to make sure that I'm awarding the right amount and level or power of magic items. It really comes into play here because that's where they'll really start doing some of the adventuring. These first bits are more just kind of local small stuff. They're not going to be as powerful, but when they get into this level four adventure and then beyond, that's where it's really going to be important for me to make sure that I am awarding the right amount of magic items so that the characters power up correctly to face those CRs correctly and keep that balance, but also so the players have that bit of a reward. Everybody wants to get magic items, so I want to make sure that we're giving them out to appease the players uh, to the best degree I can while keeping balance. So it's super important for me to make sure that I have these kind of tracked in. Now, as we start going on this, clearing the hills. So we know the tie-in from the woods and fields clearing the woods is there are goblins that have been invading the, and I call these the Blood Moon Wood. The goblins have been invading there and raiding along there. So ultimately the players should go and confront the goblin uh, area, the goblin place. Now we know this adventure is going to take a little bit of time, uh, 2.2 days. So for that, we're going to need three adventure sheets. And I want to start here and then work into a little bit of a map. So 2.25 days. I'm going to start with the um, the 0.25. So I already said that's going to be a medium and a half, which means a medium and an easy. And just to make sure of that, I am going to start crossing out the items that we're not going to be able to use for that second day. So we're going to have one medium and two easy adventure or encounters as part of this adventure. And then day one and day two. So ultimately those are the aspects of it. It's kind of a funky breakup because this little bit here is kind of, I would want to have this either at the beginning or at the end of these kind of full adventuring days. I think about it as a long rest aspect. Where, at what point are my adventurers going to want to stop and take a long rest? I imagine after a full day of adventuring, and then I don't want to have just these little laggers and then have them take another one. Unless I think of something that could really take up a lot of time and require them to rest again before they do another one. 
which is a possibility, just feels a little more um, unrealistic to me. Uh, now, it could be wrong, but generally, especially after a full day's adventure, if you give just this little bit, the players themselves are not going to be ready to stop and they'll want to go and then just finish out that last bit at the end. So my aspect is we're going to keep this to the end. Just because as they go into the adventure, do we want to have them like, get into a goblin cave and only have basically three encounters and then stop for the night? It just, just doesn't seem... Um, really pleasing to me in my in my mind <coughs> excuse me all right so we're going to start with a whole brand new day and let me get the pen so that we've got this in pen and let's get a little bit of light on the subject just so it's easier to see if you can't see and you're in chat don't hesitate let me know i'll happily bring it up to the camera so you can see better so this one here, the theme is still vulnerability of the meek. Now that's an important aspect that I'm going to put down. Meek. I want to have something meek tie into this. And our environment is hills and caverns. And then the party level, they are going to be level four. And then adventuring days, this is going to be 2.2. .2. And this is day one. And then considerations, any special considerations that we want to do. Um, goblins. So day one. You can break this up a lot of different ways. You could be exploring the hills for a while, looking for the goblin cave, and that could, you could have a lot of good adventures in the hills there, um, working, uh, trying to utilize the uh, terrain and environment to locate the goblins, uh, locate the entrance to their goblin lair, uh, ultimately encountering just other creatures in the hills, there are a lot of different encounters you could do in the hills themselves that I think could be fun and interesting. I'm a big sucker for outdoor encounters anyhow. I love nature and, um, again, utilizing terrain and things like that. But I really want this to be a dungeon delving adventure for my players. I want to get them into the goblin layer as quickly as possible. So I'm going to actually avoid a lot of the hill stuff for the beginning and I'm going to go right into the caves themselves. Now as I'm thinking about caves there's already a couple of things that are just really coming up on my mind. Um, goblins especially they're not like absolutely unintelligent. They're pretty smart creatures and they are not going to just roll over and let their goblin lair be invaded and purged of their existence. I'm not going to look at like moral dilemmas of baby goblins, anything like that. This is purely just an adventure for dungeon delving. So I'm going to start my dungeon delving out day one. I don't want to have a deadly encounter, so I'm going to cross that one right out. And the first aspect, I'm not going to have a hard encounter. And I'm actually not even going to have a medium encounter. I want to have two easy encounters right off the bat. Now, for this, boy, so much going on. I am going to bring up my D&D Beyond. And we are going to do a search for Goblin. And our Goblins are one quarter. Uh, and the Goblin boss at one. Now you can get into things like Hobgoblins where you're going to be increasing 
But just to start, we know our characters are going to be level four. We're going to have an easy encounter. And at one quarter, that means they are going to face ten goblins is an easy encounter. Ten goblins. So I'm going to start there. Ten goblins. And I'm going to put at the gates. And that's just the entry. Just an entry. Those are the goblins that are standing guard outside the goblin entrance into the entrance to the goblin lair. And that is the first easy encounter. Now the next one I want to have kind of twofold. I'm actually going to take another medium off here because I want to have traps and then traps because why not? So this is going to be an easy DC trap of alarmed entry. And this is going to be an easy DC of a defensive uh, entry. So I envision two like traps right after each other, one and then another. It's two of them kind of back to back. The first one is going to sound an alarm should the players not or the characters not disarm or get around that trap. It's going to set an alarm. The second one, if they do that first one, the second one is going to give them some type of a some type of a attack basically. And this one here, I've, I've already been thinking about it, is going to be uh, swarms of insects. And I am going to real quick pull that up on my D&D Beyond. That will be a one half CR. One half CR at level four means there will be six swarms of insects that come out of this trap. And I've already got my thoughts on how I'm going to do it. I'm thinking a hidden rope um, that, that the rope is attached to jars, lids of jars. And when those are disturbed, the jars open, basically breaking the seal, letting out all these hungry insects. So cool trap when you use terrain so that my players have to crawl through something, um, thereby also making this trap more difficult to detect and a little more challenging for them to overcome. Now my last easy one is if the alarm goes off, I want to have another batch of goblins, 10 goblins, uh, at entry 2. We'll call this the living room, because why not? So there we've already got the first aspect of the day covered, some good ideas going on what's going to happen as the adventurers travel into this subterranean world and start getting into the goblin lair. Now with this aspect I don't want to keep just constantly high numbers of goblins. Now I do want that aspect but I also want to look at what would goblins have in their lair that they might utilize. So I'm also going to be looking at other monsters and creatures that the goblins will utilize inside their lair to basically use for opportunities for me to increase uh, DCs and CR ratings for the encounters. So I'm not stuck just with goblins. But that's an initial aspect that I want to do. Now I just want to kind of plot out. That's a good amount of easy encounters for the day. Now I want to step it up a bit. I want to have a couple of mediums for sure. As they're going through, I don't want this to be 
just an ongoing slugfest one after the next of these easy encounters, uh, while that's great to wear down some of their aspects for, uh, you know, utility and everything, that isn't the point. I'm not here just to wear them out uh, over time. So I'm going to do two mediums. And then I think on the next aspect, I am actually going to throw a hard encounter at them. So that should give them plenty of activities to do throughout an adventuring day before they can get to an area where they feel like they can rest. And while I do want it to be kind of unnerving, I do want them to be able to take that long rest because I do want my players to succeed and ultimately survive this dungeon. I'm not going to build this to absolutely destroy them. I want it to be a challenge, but I do want them to survive and ultimately make it past this to uh, do the second day and then the 0.25 day and then level up. So a good aspect for this. What I want to do is look at some of... I'm actually going to grab my monster manual and my DM's guide. I should have had those off the bat and I didn't. But also a big call out now that you can get your hands on the Monsters of the Multiverse. This is the latest book to drop from Wizards of the Coast and it retouches a lot of the uh, monsters that have already been published and just updates a little bit. Lots of great information. Um, they're a little bit more balanced. They've got a little bit more lore and a little bit more information. Um, a lot of the same setup and everything as previous, but it's a really pretty cool book. I haven't gotten through all of it yet. I'm still going through it. Uh, we'll probably be rating this this next week. Couldn't say for sure, but uh, currently that's what I'm planning. All right, so I am going to keep that open as well as my DM's guide on the encounters by level. So those monster lists. And I am going to be watching for Hill as well as a little bit of Underdark just because we know those are going to be cavernous, right? Um, ultimately, we'll have more Underdark aspects in the game, uh, just not yet. That's going to be for higher tiers. But let's look and see some of the uh, hill monsters that could be found. We have got... So real quick, I just want to look at something. Yeah. Um, on the high tier for medium, we're looking at one CR5 rated monster. So there we're looking at a Bule, a Gorgon, a Hill Giant, a Revenant, a Troll, and a Werebear on the Hill aspect. And then on the Urban, we're looking at a Cambion, a Gladiator, a Revenant, a Vampire Spawn. I do like the idea of a Troll being in the Goblin Lair. I do like the idea of a Troll. A Troll would definitely get us our medium encounter and be a challenge for the players. I'm going to pop in a troll and that's going to be the medium encounter. That's a CR5 and just one troll. Now, additionally, for a medium encounter at level 4, we could have 5 CR1 monsters. That's basically goblin bosses, half ogres, brown bears, dire wolves. And we're getting into a lot of the... Uh... Oh, you know, we had um, wargs, actually. Let's see where wargs are. 
I'm going to have to look up my name and see so that warg is going to be a CR one half. which means at a medium we're looking at eight eight so here's what we're going to do uh, warg is one half and i'm going to pop in a hobgoblin which is also one half. That's the ward master. So one of those and seven wards. So this is going to be in the kennels. And then this is going to be in, we'll just call this the refuse pit. So this is where they throw things. They're keeping the troll. Uh, maybe they've captured it from down below still got to come up with the story aspect of it but that's a pretty cool aspect now we've got a hard left that means we can go all the way up to one six or one seven let's just see what we got at six and seven a chimera cyclops galeb doer wyvern stone giant stone giant young copper dragon and uh, Chimera, Cyclops, Drider, Drow Mage, Grick, Alpha, Mind Flayer, Stone Giant. That to me doesn't sound as Goblin-y layer. So I am going to go back to my Goblins. And let's say we've got... See, this is a hard one. This would be six goblin bosses. Six goblin bosses. And this is going to be in the, we'll call this the, uh, no, not the throne room yet. I don't want the, Goblin King to come a little later. So we'll say this is in a, a council chamber because why not? So these goblin bosses are the older guard, they're veteran kind of deal. There's our first day. That's pretty intense. Ultimately, I want them, after this factor, I want them to be able to take a long rest. So I have to think about that as I'm designing this dungeon. And then day two. We are going to jump right into the fire. And for a Goblin King, there is no real stat block for it. Uh, as far as like the officially published stuff, it's Goblin Bosses. So I'm going to create basically a Goblin King. And To do that, I am probably going to look at something like a Hobgoblin Captain. So we're looking at a CR3. So at level 4, a CR3, we're looking at a medium with 2. And I want to pop it back in here. Uh, CR3. This is going to be the Goblin King, and then I'm going to need another CR3, which is going to be, is going to be, what does he have with him for protection? I don't want to use a green hag, could do a white that he has. 
see what else could he have captured a hellhound possibly a hook horror that could be kind of cool yeah hook horror could be kind of cool He's like Jabba, and instead of Rancor, he has a hook horror. Great for underground, and remember, this is two days underground, so they're deep. So there is my Goblin King in the throne room. And then to get out, I'm just going to pop more goblins on there. We know for a medium encounter, uh, that's going to be... Uh, eight goblins taking away some parts. Now there are a couple of aspects that I really want to bring in to this underground area. And it's things that the goblins will either utilize or avoid completely. So one of the things I want to look for is a cave fisher. I love cave fishers underground. Let's see where those suckers. Hmm. Where's my cave fisher? I'm not seeing it. Let me check on D and D Beyond. Uh, there we go. <laughs> Excuse me. It's a CR3. A CR3, which would mean they would have two cave fissures in a layer for a medium. We'll pop that kind of early on. Two cave fissures. And that's a CR3. <coughs> Pardon me. All right. And then let's see, got yeah, three more mediums to do, unless I want to pop in some easies. Maybe we'll do one easy where they've got, uh, now this is going to be a trap. This is possibly like a rolling log over a, uh, uh, like a cavern area or a crevice in the rock. So this is, um, Dex base bridge. And this one here, we will have just more goblins. And we're looking at for an easy, we're looking at six goblins because I do want to have plenty of goblins. And then medium, we're going to have eight goblins here. And then we'll have eight goblins here lots of goblins so this one here is going to be in the um, we'll call this the landing to the second story or the lower level uh, now this one here is going to be the entry two and this one here is going to be in the uh, we'll have this be in the, we'll call it the dining room. And these aren't actually going to be dining rooms and such. Uh, this is going to be in, uh, we'll call this the, we'll call this the war room. And we'll call this the vault. And then we've got the throne room. And then this is the uh, rear exit. They should then feel safe enough to take another long rest and then have one last bit the next day. So for me, we've got one medium and two easy. I am going to say for this medium here, let's go with Let's go with this 
this would be 14. Oh, I may have been looking at the wrong one. Goblins. Let's check and see. On my day two, I may have been looking at the wrong column. Because goblins should be CR one half. Or, I'm sorry, one quarter. So yeah, that would be 14 goblins. Um, let's see, what did we have at half? Hobgoblins, that's what it was. That's eight hobgoblins. There we go. And then this will be 14 goblins. And then two easy pieces, these ones here, I want to also have um, pretty easy. So we will have another um, skill check. Uh, this is going to be something for um, this will be a constitution save trap room and then the easy aspect will have 10 goblins and then after that they should get out of the goblin caves and be able to then level up after a good night's rest. So there we go, another adventure just kind of penciled in. Nothing finalized yet. We have not built the character sheets, anything like that. What I want to do is, similar to what we did with the uh, town, the all of the aspects of the woods, all of that good stuff, let's go through and just do a quick little map out of the Goblin Cave. How are we on time? Okay, we got about 15 minutes here. All right, so what we want to do is start out with the entry to the Goblin Cave. So here we're going to have a little outpost. This is going to be a stand, and it's going to be an elevated platform so that we have some goblins with bows up high. And then we'll also have just a little crevice here where some goblins are, uh, let's say they are gambling. So we'll put, out of 10 we'll have four elevated, and we will have six gambling. So depending on how well the PCs approach, and all of that will determine whether or not those six gambling are going to kind of hide and wait to ambush or what. We'll put some uh, brush and everything out here that they could possibly hide in and attack from behind as the PCs approach. Utilize that, those features to your advantage. Um, now, onto the entryway, we're going to have it go in and do a trap right off the bat, and then a trap right off the bat. From there, the cavern is going to twist a little bit into the first room. Um, this we're going to call the living room. And then we are going to have also the... I'm going to branch this out. Kennels. And down here a little bit. It'll kind of be attached is the refuse pit. So this one is going to be below, but because I've got the kennels there, I'm going to branch this one off and attach the refuse pit. So even if the PCs don't go into the refuse pit right off the bat, as they continue to adventure on, they'll still encounter that troll. And then this is the council chamber And these goblin bosses here are just talking about the plans for raiding. So then I want a long stretch. So this is a deep cleft in the earth. I want distance. I want the PCs to say, hey, we've got this all built up. Let's sleep in the kennels or in the council chain. Let's find a place to rest so we can get that long rest. They've already had a pretty good adventure getting this far. 
deep into the earth and some difficult terrain and everything that we're going to really make them feel worn out and tuckered after getting this far. So that's day one and I feel pretty good about it. Now after that we go into day two. So this is the landing. And this I want to put noisy. I want the PCs to not feel comfortable going further. At this point here, I want them to feel, well, we know we've got this all cleared. We're comfortable. Let's block that off. Let's seal it. Let's stand on whatever. I want them to be unnerved. So I'm going to put noisy there. And then this is the uh, bridge. And then out here is the dining room. And we're going to spiral down a little bit further. This is the war room. And then the vault. And then from there, that's where we want to break it off a little bit. And have the throne room and the rear exit. And then that rear exit, again, they should feel like they've got everything pretty good. So that will be a back door. Now, ultimately, what I want them, what I'm hoping they'll do is get to that point and want to take some type of a rest. And then that one there actually is not going to be a cavern out. Um, and that is actually going to be a cavern up. Because I do still want them to feel underground, but we'll have it be a sharp way up. So that one there goes up and then back up to the top. So this is kind of like, here's floor one, floor two. I'm looking at it almost like from the side. As we get back up, this is where we will have the trap room. And then the goblins at the end there. So we're going to have a 14 goblin here. Um, we didn't name that one. We'll just call that the uh, back exit. And then 10 goblins here. This is going to be the back door. And that's where they'll get back to the surface. They're able to get back to town after having done this adventure, exploring these pretty dynamic caverns and ultimately addressing the threat of the goblins via the Goblin King and its war council of hobgoblins who are kind of pushing them to explore and expand and get worse and worse and worse and worse on the region. So that is going to be our Goblin Cave. You can see this is just extremely, extremely rough mapping. I'm not going to map this out in more detail because I really want to utilize descriptors and um, just talk about the location itself to one provide a little bit more uneasiness to the players to the actual players i don't want them to view everything out and say let's go to one let's go to two let's go to three let's go to five let's go to six let's go to seven let's go to eight let's go to nine i don't want them to do that i want them to actually almost feel the adventure in exploring this cavern. And I can only do that if I would give really good descriptions. Luckily, I've been able to um, go into a lot of caverns and I've got a pretty good aspect of how to describe them really well using four senses. So it, it really feels good, smells good, and temperature is really good, and kind of the dryness of the air. So using good descriptors and really focusing on how I can make this feel underground for my players is going to help the character's adventure in here. Now if they map this out, 
I'll be able to give them some rough directions after about, you know, five minutes, it turns to the right. I'm not going to tell them 32 feet because unless they're going out there with a measuring tape, they're not going to know exactly. Now, if they say they're going to start pacing or something like that, I'll dial it in a little bit more. And then I'll just note um, that we said this was uh, 27 paces. And this one was 62 paces. I really, I'm not going to get to that level of detail where I'm going to map this out by uh, range at this aspect. Because unless I publish this, I'm not going to need it. And then I'll use the notes from this if I ever do decide to publish the materials. I'll use the notes that I make to actually map it out at that point in time. Now I've got my level four adventure in the hills near Goldgate all kind of planned and roughed out. All I need to go back and do is complete all of the monster build encounter sheets and assign treasure. Once that's done, this adventure is ready to put with the others and I've got my entire tier one adventure set for this campaign all done. It ties into the overall campaign with that touch of the cultists of Hakate, but also regionally. At this point, the characters, by the end of this adventure, the characters should really feel accomplished, uh, nothing overwhelming. They should definitely feel like now they will definitely be able to fit in in the Adventures Guild. Once they make it up to Golden Vale, they will be embraced with open arms. They'll have a little bit of reward uh, jingling in their pockets that they'll be looking at spending in this bigger metropolis and really feeling positive about themselves, both as individual characters, but also as a party as well. This is all designed to get them to work together and become an actual party. Because when they start the next tier, when things really start changing from going from those local heroes into heroes of the realm, that's when shit will get real. So this part is super, super important to set a strong foundation so that the party is more likely to continue adventuring together and becoming those actual epic heroes that I, as the GM, hope they want to become because I can't force them. All I can do is present some aspects and hope that they enjoy it and continue on those ways. If they don't and I have to adjust and, and rejuggle some things, I'll tackle that bridge when I get there. I just want to have a good foundation to get them on the way. So next week, what are we going to be covering? We may do just a quick wrap up of this first four part adventure. But I really am looking forward to getting into the Tier 2. So we will probably just do a very quick review and then jump right into Golden Vale. The party's aspect of moving to Golden Vale and getting on that route. By this point, all the storms have ended. They've gone through. They've helped the villagers out. They've become local heroes. They're going to be awarded two donkeys uh, to help them in this trek and to get them on the road to Golden Vale. So I really want to focus on what happens when that next tier comes in because that's when the theme changes, that's when the focus of the story changes, that's when they start seeing the broader picture. So I hope you enjoyed. If you were able to follow me in chat, uh, don't hesitate, let me know. Otherwise, make sure you do give a follow just so we can help grow our followership. We want to be able to uh, reach new community members we're not looking for subscribers. Uh, we're just hoping to gain our followers, our amount of followers. So please help spread the news of our channel and the content that we create. And we hope that we are inspiring and ultimately helping drive your games to become more enjoyable and unique, different, and really inspiring for your players. Until next show, which is Wednesday, when we're going to be creating a character based off a miniature. Hope you have a fantastic week, and we'll see you then. Bye-bye.